Hello, ICRS friends. How are you? The visionaries of cartilage repair series is getting better and better, isn't it? Our second episode was with Dr. Dong Kwon Chi from China, and he gave us a very fantastic message. Love what you do and do what you love. Isn't it true? We always like to do what we love. Today, in our third episode, I would like to introduce you to two more incredible people, Dr. Elizabeth Vinod from Christian Medical College, Bellor, India. She is an incredible woman. She works in Department of Physiology, but has deep interest in cartilage repair science. She has got multiple high-rated papers, and she has done tremendous work in the field in India. And today's interviewer is Dr. Bashir Jikriya. He is from Aspatar Hospital, Doha, but as we record our interview, he is getting shifted to John Hopkins, USA. I welcome both of them today, Dr. Bashir and Dr. Elizabeth. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Deepa Goyal, for uh, introducing us. And uh, I'm honored today to interview Dr. Elizabeth Vino from uh, Christian Medical College in Valor, India. Uh, she's a teacher and also a well-renowned researcher in cartilage. So it's an honor to interview today, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, my first question to you is, how do you feel being a cartilage visionary recognized by the ICRS? And how did you feel when Dr. Deepa Goyal uh, sent you the email that you were nominated as one of our visionaries? Hi, Dr. Bashid. I would like to thank you for this opportunity. So when I first saw the mail, I was in, in fact surprised. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know what it was actually about. And then when I realized it was about uh, talking about my work and as a uh, being recognized as a visionary for ICRS, I was really excited and I'm actually looking forward to this interview. Thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's an honor for, for me to interview you today. And, I, and we'd love to know a little bit more about your journey for cartilage. Uh, one of the things we want to know is what motivated you to specialize in cartilage research? Now, you have a well-rounded CV and what kind of guided you towards uh, cartilage research? Now, I would say it would be mainly my educational background. So um, I'm a, basically a physiologist and I, and I teach first year med school students. And we have a very basic culture lab setting. So I had uh, one of the orthopedicians who's actually my main mentor who approached me saying that there is this uh, population of cells within cartilage which are showing potential. Could you could we try out just a one single project? So that's where I started my journey. And uh, so the, I would say personal experience and professional curiosity, I guess, which has uh, helped me come this far. How has the uh, progression been as far as your journey? Like, uh, where did you start and then where, where have you progressed in this so, journey? Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Bashir. So uh, when I started out, which is, I would say around, I've been actively involved in it for maybe some five, six years, and I thought it was just one study. Uh, so uh, I guess that's how research works. So um, uh, I first I started off with an animal study, uh, and then I realized there was a lot of lacuna in the field. It was a recently uh, discovered um, subset of population within the cartilage, and there was a lot more phenotypic characterization required for it. So in fact, my first ever publication was a review because I wanted to understand the field. And I realized there were so many questions to be answered, but then I didn't have the facilities or I didn't have the funding to start. But then I've had people and collaborations who have helped me get this far. So uh, five years down the lane, I think we have not reached uh, the goal because that's how it is. But definitely we've come to understand this uh, particular cell type much better and we've understood that it definitely has potential and we must do our best to take it forward uh, for uh, uh, clinical translation. A little bit like a little summary of your research and what are your like short-term goals and long-term goals for the research? Yes. So uh, what we actually work with is uh, these stem cells within the articular cartilage, which are referred to as chondroprogenitors. And we see that these cell types, in comparison to what is co uh, commonly used in clinical trials, which would be bone marrow MSCs and chondrocytes, they show uh, a phenomenal uh, chondrogenic potential and more importantly, a reduced hypertrophic potential, which is basically the indispensable combination that we are looking out for, for achieving a genuine hyaline-like repair. And so even in our animal studies, we see that it is good. 
And so now we've moved on to comparing them using animal models, ex vivo models, uh, and trying to karyotyping uh, these cells, especially in the view of uh, seeing how we can take a translation. Uh, 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 so um, this uh, cell type sh shows a lot of promise. So we're hoping to um, push that forward and uh, see if we can take it forward uh, and especially our target group of population include early grade osteoarthritis patients uh, and also chondral defects. Long-term goal is mostly to, to treat these early osteoarthritic patients. Yes, yes. They are the main subtype that we are focusing on. And uh, so we've come to a point where we see it has good potential, but it needs a lot of collaboration with material science bioengineers to see if we could push it forward, uh, incorporating bioscaffolds as a delivery system for this cell type. Yes, that is the uh, long-term goal. As you mentioned, collaborators, who are you collaborating with currently with these projects? Uh, so, uh, so currently we have the orthopedics department here in Christian Medical College. And uh, um, I have a lot of collaborators outside India uh, who are uh, given their expertise and also uh, where we have actually uh, MOUs and we send our cells across and we're getting transcriptomic analysis um, and a lot of other things also being done. So um, my main collaborators would be the orthopedics department. We have also material science, the Weller Institute technology within here, uh, India, and uh, Erasmus University, Dr. Heyo, and Dr. Bhupal and Ramasamy from University of Adelaide. So they are my main collaborators. Excellent. And I see that you, you were part of the uh, ICS as well. Yes, uh, yes. Know? and you've kind of progressed into ICRS along with that, right? Yes, yes. yes That's Dr. a lot of collaboration Dr. with ICS, right? Yes. So uh, my first ever uh, step into ICRS was through ICS. So uh, long back, when I initially started, which was around uh, five years back, um, the, so ICS, uh, Indian Cartley Society, have these state meets and one happened to be within Tamil Nadu. So uh, one of the orthopedicians encouraged me to go and present my work, which was very, very preliminary at that time. And I happened to be selected to go represent ICS at the ICRS. And that's where I met a lot of people. And I actually realized that it was bigger than I thought. And uh, uh, the cartilage field actually involves a lot more thing than, than just my focus. And so that's where I even got to meet uh, Dr. Heyo, where I got trained uh, for, for my fellowship um, for around a month to learn something about the osteochondral unit, which is a very important vital component of all my evaluation that I do here. And it's I've gone, and in fact, I'm going to go for another fellowship in another few days, uh, which is to UK Wales. And th these are, ICRS has provided me, I would say ICS through ICRS has given me the opportunity to for collaboration. Yes, I agree. Yes. And also, uh, you mentioned your mentors. Uh, who are some of your mentors that have guided you along the way? We all, all have right. mentors. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, uh, my first ever mentor was Dr. Bhupal and Ramasamy. Uh, he was an orthopedician who was here in CMC Velour, who moved on now, who's actually currently a uh, uh, working as a physician there in University of Adelaide, Australia. So he was the first one who approached me, who was actually trained by the pioneers in the field and told me, we're just going to do one project. It's just going to be one animal study and then we're done. We're going to clinical trials. Uh, so I, I agreed. <laughs> And then, um, so he's, he's, and he's still my constant source of support, even now, and even though he's not in the country with me. Um, and uh, my other collaborator is um, uh, Dr. Solomon Satish Kumar, who is also a professor in my own department, and also Dr. Alfred Job Daniel. Both of them are my guides also for my uh, PhD that I'm currently pursuing. And uh, so it, it's uh, the collaboration here mostly involves that I do this uh, work that is a bit more monotonous. So there are chances that it can get mundane and I may miss out on uh, mistakes. And they have this beautiful capacity of combing through the lines and, you know, picking out the things that are seems to be more of uh, routine for me. So uh, they help me a lot with that. And I have a good team here, which uh, involves technicians and fellowship students. And, uh, you know, they're, we're all a part of a team and... Uh, I have a pathologist like Dr. Anjali Goyal who helps me uh, grade my uh, samples once I've done my studies, my animal study samples. 
um dr mata from hungary he helps me with transcriptic analysis so it's it's expanding i hope it you know i get more uh, collaborations uh, to take this work forward that's fabulous i should commend you on a on a, an outstanding cv i see all the publications you have but one thing i i uh, realized that it's it's tough research when especially when you get some negative results and yes and by looking at your research, you, and we discussed this before, that you had gotten some negative results. How do you continue moving forward when you see those negative results? I would say most of my results are negative. <laughs> <laughs> and a very few of them, a handful of them are, uh, I wouldn't say positive, but, you know, but they seem promising. And I, but one thing is I've always been persistent in getting these negative results published, even though it's difficult, uh, mainly because I've realized a lot of those negative results are actually now working out in my positive. And it also would help uh, other people who would maybe not repeat this, not required to repeat the same because you don't see those things, you know, there's uh, ethically, it would be right, I feel to get these results across. And so a lot of these negative results, they've just opened up new questions for me to answer. And uh, I would say it's log exponential because of these studies and, uh, I would say they're more of a boon than a bane in terms of helping me move forward. What other challenges do you see? Have you seen, you know, besides the negative results, what other challenges have you seen progressing with your research? All right. Um, it's um, so I work with these samples that are dependent on. Um, uh, so, for example, if I need a non-disease sample, it's a road traffic accident case. So I shouldn't be praying for one, but I'm waiting for one. And so uh, that's one of the challenges, getting a team. Uh, it's very important. Uh, that's one of my big learning curves that I needed to uh, expand my collaboration, get a good team. All right. I, I, by his grace, got some good team now. And I hope that continues because uh, in the field of research, it's always a moving field. People come and go, but then you always need to have the base set. Uh, so that was also one of the challenges. Another another main challenge was uh, fundings. You know, you you uh, you get funding; it has to come across, and then uh, uh, balancing all of that and uh, trying to uh, be able to get results out in time, knowing that it's novel. So it's it's uh, it's uh, I think it's important to even consider that uh, time is of the essence and not sit on data. Um, I think those were a few of my challenges, and. Um, yeah, it's been going all right, I would say. I've seen that you've gotten two uh, external grants with you as being the lead PI on them. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, so then, my initial grants were, was when I was a co-PI. Uh, our initial funding was from AO Trauma. So I work in an institution that is very pro-research, and they do provide a few seed grants that has really helped me uh, set the lab up. And so these external grants have actually helped me do uh, bigger studies. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, I've had challenges for the fundings coming in, but then they're in now. So I'm, uh, it's going. It's all most of it is ongoing. Yes. Managing your own life as far as uh, being, uh, I, I know you are a mother, uh, a wife, and the balancing home life with your research life and also as a teacher. How do you make? How do you do? Able to do all these activities and still maintain. Your balance in your life yeah uh, it's <laughs> it's been uh it, it's not easy but i would say i i i think i have it easier um i, I work in a department that's very pro research so i have these uh, uh, stipulated number of hours or academic uh, um, commitments so uh, i kind of allocate specific time blocks so that I'm able to also do this uh, and also go do my research. I'm an urgent scientist. So research is more like an additional thing for me. I'm primarily a teacher. So um, there are times that I have to work outside working hours, but I have a family that is really understanding. And especially my husband's very happy if I'm busy. <laughs> So uh, and uh, so I remember starting off when uh, Dr. Bupalan approached me, I was actually expecting my second. So I was worried how I would manage. But then now they've grown up. And so they're also pretty understanding. And uh, yeah, I think I'm in a situation where I, I have a very good supportive environment when it comes to family. So therefore, I'm able to just rush off when I get some sample, you know, at some order and I'm able to take it forward. Yes, I, I, I think, yeah, I've been put in a good place. Yeah. Always great to have a good support system because that actually... Yes, it's, it's very essential. Yes. 
to a support system. It's very important. Uh, one other question I have is, is uh, just going back to your research, uh, these um, you, you're starting to collaborate. Yes. And you see yourself with ICRS in collaboration. And you think, because uh, you're saying you want to be more involved with ICRS. And what what are the limitations that you had to, to be part of ICRS and part of, you know, in collaboration? And how can ICRS help you with that? All right. Yeah. So um, I got the opportunity of ICRS through ICS, and that's how even I came to know about ICRS. And uh, the one of the, uh, I wouldn't say limitations, but uh, more of uh, a difficulty is, um, I think, the representation of us there. I think that it would really benefit if uh, um, we had more uh, that we could, I mean, more speakers and, you know, opportunities to probably uh, host an issue in their journal. And you would be actually surprised <laughs> how much we could, we are able to do with the limited funding, et cetera, that we have. Um, so even if you take chondro progenitors, uh, even the last ICRS that I attended in Spain, there was actually no specific uh, session on progenitors when it's an upcoming field. And um, uh, I, I think uh, it would be important to focus accessibility in India also, give us more opportunities. And I think uh, that would really help us. And uh, something that is difficult for us is also going, uh, you know, uh, making the funds to reach these places. It's not as easy. Um, so probably a help there and probably conduct the ICS, ICRS in India. <laughs> you'll have a huge crowd attending it yeah so that would be really good and i think it would foster global partnerships with indians yes yeah i, I think it's a collaboration yes and, and one of the great things about icrs is these collaborations you oh meeting it's, yes people, definitely advancing your research you know and i i think some of the innovative strategies that you just mentioned as far as like doing conferences in uh in india or having more representation is probably a big for you future collaborations within India, right? Uh, my other question is, is as far as your cartilage progenitor cells, what do you see the future of that in the next five to 10 years? Like, and where do you think we could lead that to as far as application? All right. So uh, the in vitro studies that uh, uh, we're currently uh, conducting shows that it's really promising when you were to compare it with the other cells. Uh, but however, we are running preclinical and in vivo studies to sh be able to replicate the results. So that's where we stand right now. So I would say five to 10 years, probably if we could uh, uh, show good results in terms of uh, uh, its potential, comparative potential, I think this could be a, a, a good cell that you could take forward. Uh, and it could elevate the progression of OA and probably even prevent the need for a replacement if you could target the early OA uh, population. And um, there is a lot of lacunae still in terms of uh, seeing uh, bioscaffolds that are conducive for these cells. And we're also working with secretome from these cells to see if we could provide it as a cell-free therapeutic off-shell product. And that would actually be the... Uh, the I would say the perfect way to take it forward in case you could come up with an allogenic uh, product. But uh, the framework, regulatory framework in India currently is quite sketchy. So it may take some time, but I'm sure if I have everything ready by then, uh, we could uh, probably run the first trial in India. And in fact, the first trial with progenitors is currently now, uh, I think it's, it's running with Birmingham and uh, Swansea being involved in it. So I think, yes, we could definitely take it forward. And I'm hoping Excellent. to do that. Excellent. So one, one other question is like, you're young and you're starting in this field and you're expanding. What uh, advice would you give to other young researchers who and practitioners who are interested in cartilage and how do they progress to get to your level and to find their passion for this? All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little tough question, but, but we were all I, there at one time, right? I so know. We all, we all I, I, would say, there. I would say you need a little bit of craziness. <laughs> you need to be, uh, stay curious. And uh, I think it's, it's important to embrace collaboration. And uh, you need to be persistent because you will see negative results. And uh, 
it's all right to take a break, but you need to come back to it. And I think it's very important to pr prioritize patient-centric approaches because as a, a basic uh, researcher, you get too involved in your work and answering your questions, and sometimes you forget the bigger goal. So it's always important to have somebody to you know keep reminding you that the bigger goal is you have to reach the patient. So keep pushing it forward and don't get stuck on things. And um, so therefore, if you see, we have a lot of things running on the side, you know, something answering a question, but also uh, answering uh, regulatory questions that would come up. So I, I think that's also very important. I, I think being curious and being persistent is the key. Excellent. I, I would say the same thing. It's all passions of being curious and searching, right? Yes, true, true. We had discussed before that you're a gardener. So what, 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 what about gardening gives you, you know, sanity and makes you feel... <laughs> It I think it's time. something similar to research. Your plants die out on you <laughs> and they're costly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, it's something nice to get dirt under your fingers. First, and, uh, first of all, what, what, do you, what do you plant? What, what, what type of uh, garden? So I'm, I'm, I'm more into foliage. <laughs> I like leaves, different kind of leaves. Uh, so I'm into caladiums right now. So <laughs> they need a lot of tender, loving care and they die out on you quite easily, similar to research. So probably that's why <laughs> I've taken it up. But it's nice. It's 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 a nice breathtaking, uh, you know, <laughs> a break from your routine. Yeah. So I, I think it's very important that you have something else. You know, it's, it's, it's OK to drop research, but come back to it. But you have something else to do. I think that's really important to keep you going. Yeah, so I'm into gardening. We have dogs. We take care of dogs. We have puppies. Now we are a family of 13 from four with all the dogs included. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and I, I like to exercise a bit whenever I get the time. I'm not persistent, but I'm getting old. So <laughs> yeah. Excellent. The gardening is, uh, re relaxes you like a meditation for you? Ah, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Probably because I don't get the time, and my kids are all of us noisy. It's it's a house full, so <laughs> I don't think I'll have peace and quiet for that. But then, yeah, gardening works out for me now. My my last couple of questions. One is yes, uh, is like, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? What do you want to be like? Where do you want to be at, and where do you see yourself in the field of cartilage and just in just in your career as well? Yes, so in five years, I hope we have some good results in terms of animal studies and uh, we're able to uh, answer a lot of regulatory questions to take this forward. And I hope I can train uh, young researchers in this field so that they can go wherever they are because you need that collaboration. It's very important to share knowledge. And um, uh, so yeah, that is, I'm hoping I can get there in five years time. I think, yeah, I, I'm happy if I can reach that level for now. Yes. And at the same uh, institution, you want to stay and progress there? Yes, I am a permanent staff here, and so my family is here. So I think, yeah, probably take a break, grow for fellowships, probably a sabbatical, and I, I will be back here, yeah, mostly here, yes. CMC's life. As far as collaboration uh, within ICRS, where do you, you guys see yourself going anywhere else for collaboration? Where would you like to go or any future? Uh, uh, within ICRS? Within ICRS or any collaborators within Yes. There? Uh, so uh, I'm currently going to Swansea uh, in a few days to learn about gene modification of these cells. So that's one major collaboration I'm looking forward to. Uh, so uh, that's also uh, a platform. And I, most of my collaborations are through ICRS. So I'm grateful for that. Yes. And uh, yeah, I have to see how it goes. At this point, I'm not sure. Oh, that's excellent. It's been an honor to talk to you and uh, have a nice discussion. Uh, you're making great progress in the world of research and cartilage, and that's a, uh, I, I, I give you all the credit for that, and it's amazing. I uh, wish you all the success in the future and be watching out for all your publications, and hopefully I continue to see this progress and make a difference in, uh, in the world of uh, cartilage in the next five to ten years. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Bashir, for her, uh, having me and also Dr. Deepak uh, Goyal for the opportunity. I must make a mention that ICS has been my family 
and we are uh, we began as a very small family and we care for each other so much and so and for the opportunity that ICS has given uh, me to go on to ICRS and I remember the first time that ICS sent me to ICRS Deepak Goyal was um, he was so caring he wanted to ensure that I went reached I came back safe so I hope that we can show this love and uh, we develop this love with uh, with ICRS too you know like like how we are one small nice family here in ICS. Uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. We just saw a, one more incredible interview. Today we met Dr. Elizabeth Vinod, who is energetic, enthusiast, and a younger colleague from India, who has limited opportunities. But still she has made her way up. She started her journey from Indian Cartilage Society, making friends and contacts, and then use those friends and contacts to make many, many friends in ICRS. She's in a perfect example where we can see that how a national society can play a role for upliftment of its members. And this national society can form a bridge for our lovely International Cartilage Repair Society. This bridge is crucial between national societies and ICRS. And Dr. Elizabeth Winod is a perfect example of it. Not only that, she is now making multiple international collaborations to make a difference. A difference not only in her life, her, her scientific caliber, but in society at large to, for the upliftment of cartilage repair. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Vinod, and thank you, Dr. Bashir, for this fantastic interview. Friends, next month we will come with one more episode of Visionaries of Cartilage Repair from ICRS. And do you know, again, who will be the interviewee and interviewer? Well, keep guessing. I'm not going to tell you. See you again in October. Bye.